and welcome to GMBN Tech Ask, where you use hashtag AskGMBNTech down in the comments of any of our videos, and we'll try and get back to you with an answer on a show like this. Well, let's get going. So my first question is from Ruslan M, who says, is there a difference between having a handlebar with higher rise compared to having more spaces under the stem and vice versa? Can I lower my cockpit just by moving some spaces above the stem, or is it better to buy handbars with a lower rise? Um, so the short answer is yes, it does make a difference a little bit, uh, but it does also depend on how slack your head angle is um, or how much roll you choose with your new handbars. So just to illustrate this, I've got a set of forks here because your stem is obviously attached to the steerer here. And if we were to have a slack head angle. Now I'll just uh, angle this quite dramatically just to make the point. Uh, if you had a really slack head angle and you were to move your stem up the steerer, then it's actually moving back slightly because this angle is diagonal. So what that does is it raises your bars, but it also brings them in a bit. It effectively shortens your reach by moving the stem up and vice versa. If you were to move your stem down, it could be moving your handlebars along a little bit as well. So effectively increasing the reach. Whereas if you were to buy higher rise handlebars, for example, then your stem stays the same and your high rise bars are just higher uh, and vice versa. If you buy lower rise bars, your handlebars just come down and you don't affect the reach at all. So to answer your question, yes, you can move them around to get an idea of whether you like lower handlebars or higher handlebars, uh, but it might change the reach a little bit. And so the bike may feel a little shorter or a little longer but it is a good way of testing the water before buying some new handlebars, for sure. Um, and then if you want to keep your stem where it is and keep the reach, then you can just buy the high rise. <clears throat> Also, I think the difference is um, slightly personal preference, but also aesthetics. I would say, for example, XE riders love to slam their stem right down to the frame um, and they like flat bars and they like the look of that. So you, if you wanted a slammed look, uh, but perhaps that stem or the handlebars are too low, then you can effectively correct it a little bit with high rise bars. Um, equally, if you are enduro, because I know a lot of enduro riders who always have to have high rise bars and they don't like the look of flat bars, then you could have your high rise bars and just bring the stem down a little bit closer to the frame if you don't actually like the height of those bars. But just be aware that moving the stem changes the reach slightly. So Santo says, can water contaminate your rotors? Uh, also, if I use diluted soap and water and accidentally get it on my disc, will it contaminate? Um, so no water won't contaminate, uh, but your soap, um, I don't know what soap you're using. There will be some cleaning detergents out there or soaps uh, that may have contaminants in them. And so you won't want to get that on your rotors. Uh, also, when you're cleaning your bike with soap, um, even if you are using a bike specific one, which usually I would say, well, almost guarantee a bike specific cleaning product doesn't have contaminants in it, even if you were using that, the action of cleaning something around your discs, like for example, using a brush to clean your cassette can flick oil and mud and contaminates contaminants onto your rotor, um, even if the soap is fine. So firstly, I would say don't use any uh, non-bike specific cleaning products on your rotors directly. Always cover your discs if you are cleaning your bike so that you don't get anything else onto your rotors. And then I would use a bike specific disc cleaner like um, a disc brake cleaner on your rotors or isopropyl alcohol to clean them off afterwards just to make sure. Um, I've also done a specific disc cleaning video. I'll leave that link in the description below uh, where I go on to say that even automobile or car related disc brake cleaner is 
possibly a contaminant, so don't use that. Always go for bike-specific or isopropyl alcohol. So Patrick Joseph Belanta says, can you run a shorter travel fork with a higher travel rear? I mean, yes if you want to, as long as it fits. So if you were changing your fork, for example, all you need to be concerned with is the axle to crown height. So your bike will have a manual or a suggestion somewhere online that will say that there's a minimum or a maximum axle to crown height, and you can have whatever travel you want as long as it meets that. Um, do be aware that if you're changing your travel, for example, that will change the length. And if you higher uh, raise your front end or lower your front end, then you might be affecting your geometry. So that is one of the changes. Um, if you're suggesting that you're wanting to change your rear, um, some bike frames and some shocks uh, can take spaces that will change the travel of the rear. Um, so for example, the Nuke Proof Reactor, uh, there's a Nuke Proof Reactor ST, which is a short travel, and that is 10 mil shorter than the normal reactor. And it's not a different frame and it is not a different shock. It achieves this by a very small spacer. I think it's like 1.5 mil perhaps, but a very small spacer, which barely affects the geometry but it does change the rear. Um, so basically what I'm saying is there are things that you can do in order to change uh, front and rear if you choose to, as long as the stroke in the rear is correct and the fittings are correct and the uh, measurement of your forks are correct, then you can do whatever you want. So Adba uh, Davedi says, why hasn't any derailleur manufacturer or even custom fabrication experimented with an upside down derailleur as a solution to keeping the derailleur safe from rocks and stuff? And what complications would arise from using such a setup? <laughs> I mean, they sort of have, um, but let's think about this. So a derailleur underneath uh, is quite a good design, although it seems quite vulnerable, um, because the uh, pulley wheels and the derailleur will move as the cassette uh, rotates clockwise. And so then it can move and effectively feed the chain and then the cassette picks it up with the teeth and pops it on the top and continues. And if you think about the action of pedaling and pulling on your chain, the tension is at the top. So if the derailleur was at the top, not only would the chain be coming uh, from underneath and kind of pushing into the derailleur as it moves, but also the tension from the pedals would actuate the derailleur uh, and actuate that tensioner and it would all be a little bit messy. And then let's not forget that this big thing needs to find a place somewhere uh, at the top, which usually has a frames chain stay um, in the, not chain stay, sorry, a seat stay in the way. Um, and there's just a lot going on to fit it in. Uh, I will suggest going to our Eurobike 2022 special where we looked at the Lau Super Drive, where some guys had basically tried to engineer an upside down derailleur, but what they needed to do was effectively divide it into two. So you had one pulley wheel which changed um, the gearing, but that had to be nestled in the back of the frame in a little hole, and then you had to have the tensioner removed and put at the front to keep the tension on the chain. But in order to do that, they then had to have a high pivot as well. So you had three cogs at the front and then this thing here. So it was quite complicated. I think probably too complicated and expensive for a lot of manufacturers to go by. Although Nikolai have taken that on board and they are selling that system with the Nucleon. So do check that out if that sort of thing interests you. Um, but also, you know, there's gearboxes if you really don't like derailers, you can check out uh, gearboxes, which means you can change gears uh, somewhere around the front and just have effectively a single speed um, instead of a derailleur at the bottom. So there are other options. Um, my final question here from uh, Cathal says, hi guys, uh, I have ride wrap on my rays, but a rock happened to hit one of the exposed areas between the wrap pieces. The carbon looks okay, but is now exposed and the paint is flaking at the spot. Uh, what approach should, would you take to stop the rot? Um, first up, I would 
I personally would get that checked out by a professional to see if it is cracked or not. Um, usually with paint cracks, they're quite linear um, and very clean. Uh, if you have a sort of a jaggedy mark on the paint, then that tends to be a crack uh, from the carbon underneath that has this jaggedy pattern. Uh, do check out one of my videos, which was how to fix carbon, where I spoke to a professional who showed me the difference and also he showed me the different techniques that you can go through in order to check that it's okay. Um, so you can use x-rays, some people um, use heat treatments to find those cool spots. Uh, you can even put it under a microscope and you can sometimes see the movement. Um, so that would be my approach is to check that it's not cracked. Um, if it turns out that it's just a chip of paint off of the carbon, um, then it, you don't need, there's, you've mentioned rot. The carbon won't rot. It is, it's waterproof, it's fine. It's not going to be damaged by uh, water uh, being on it at all. Um, you can put some paint over it if you don't trust it, uh, that's up to you. Um, but I personally would leave it if it's not a crack. If it is a crack, um, then talk to one of those professionals who's x-rayed it or looked at it for you and get it repaired. It's actually probably more affordable than you think and certainly more affordable than a replacement. So that's all I've got time for today, but thanks for watching. And if you have any questions after this, then use hashtag AskGMBNTech down in the comments and we'll get back to you.